It's an honor for me to be here with you guys tonight. I, I just want to say thank you so much for your time and your willingness just to come and be out here and um, just uh, to, to start the dialogue on this conversation and just wanted to continue to learn uh, about that. Uh, my name is Rodney Wright, married to my wife Tracy. We celebrated 30 years of marriage uh, this year, which is pretty special. We have three children. Um, our oldest daughter, Whitney, is uh, 27, married uh, about a year and a half ago, and a uh, school teacher. And then two boys, Austin and Keaton. They are uh, 26 and 22, and they're just now reaching that age where they think I know things. You know, when they're, when they're, when they're 15, you know, they're at their peak of wisdom and dad's at their depths of stupidity. You know how that gets, and then the brain kind of changes, as we know, uh, later on in life. Um, but they're great kids, and they have a deep faith, and we're really grateful uh, for our family. I came out here with a friend of mine, Scott uh, Raymond from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So he came out, was with us on the retreat, and he's been a good friend of mine for nearly 20 years in this family. So I just want to say uh, thanks for, uh, for coming here today. A couple things as we start here today that might be helpful. I, I'm not going to... My wife and I do these trainings together, and we have kind of like a two-hour training and a four-hour training, just as much as how in-depth or how much we can go through it. There's no way I'm going to be able to get all this to you, and I know that the mind can only take what the seat can endure. So uh, I just want to say for some of the kids that are here, thanks for bringing mom and dad. I hope I help them for you, you know, but way to go. Way to bring your mom and dad here with you today. Um, so let's start with a word of prayer. How shall we? And then we'll, uh, we'll start our time here today. Oh, Father, thank you so much for uh, Faith Bible Church. And thank you for Maryland, the state. And thank you for our country. Thank you for the brothers and sisters that are here today. And we hope this becomes a real good learning environment. Uh, thank you that you are the source of all truth. And that, um, that the author of truth entered our world in Jesus and came to show us the better way to live. So today we ask that you would give us insight and help us to learn how to see the better way in our area of human sexuality. Thank you that you have such a high view of us that you became one of us in Jesus uh, because that's how much you love us. Uh, thank you for our time today and our, our time to be together. Amen. Um, let me just say a couple things just as we begin. Uh, number one is you don't have to agree with everything I say here today on this subject. How's that for a presenter coming uh, today? It's okay for you to disagree, but if anything, I want you to turn your brain on and I want you to begin to think critically about this subject matter. And you know, I don't want you to uh, come to church and turn your brain off and just say, whatever they say on the stage is true, Heil Hitler at the end. You understand what I'm saying? I want you to think um, because God has given you a brain and I believe that uh, we can wrestle with truth. And the reason I say that is, is because um, we all have a high view of scripture. You do here in this church, don't you? High view of scripture, what scripture is. Uh, this book that we say is inspired by God. And yet this book that's inspired, how many of you know we all can't interpret the book the same way? Are you with me on that? That's why there's thousands of different Christian denominations across the world, because we can't agree on the Bible, right? So now we're going to talk about this area of human sexuality. And uh, so I only say that to say, um, I really do believe, though, that Scripture gives us good insight to talk about this subject matter. But more than anything, I want you to begin to think, and, and uh, it's okay to ask questions. That's probably what I like the best about our retreat this weekend. There was just some good questions asked. And how many questions cause us to think? And, and cause new ways of us to see things uh, that may be uh, different. So anyway, I've given you a hand out there. Um, the organization I represent is Pure Desire. How many have heard of Pure Desire? If you attend this church, you have, because Tom and Michelle. Um, and so on behalf of our founder, Dr. Ted Roberts, and Nick Stumbo, our executive director, it's really an honor to be here today. Um, some of these experts are, are these points that I, I've given you here. I just made us three main talking points that I want to just discuss. Our book has these 10 principles that we spell out in our book. Um, the book that we wrote, uh, it could have had a lot of titles, but uh, the editor and printer, Pure Desire, decided this one, how to talk with your kids. 
about sexuality. And the conversation on sexuality isn't the one talk you have when they're 12 for 100 minutes. Maybe some of you kids remember that, or some of us remember that, thinking, Dad, are you okay? Dad, breathe, breathe, breathe. You know, Dad, you want to sit down? Dad, you want water. You know what I mean? As Dad's trying to share what they know. But it's the one minute, hundred, it's the hundred one minute talks that you have with your kid as they're growing up. It's the age appropriate information that you give them all through life. And so the book isn't so much a how to book about anatomy, there's plenty of those books out there. This is a, a book about a family system and the culture you want to create within your home. Now, typically, there's three ways when we think about how we come to know and learn about our human sexuality. Um, three general ways. Does anybody have a guess of what one of, the, one of those ways might be of how we come to learn about our sexuality? Yes? The internet, okay. Uh, but at least, at least the last 25 years, the internet, right? But think about even before there was the internet, and I think another word for that, Eric, is culture, right? So culture is uh, always has a voice, always has had a voice about our human sexuality. So culture is one way in which we learn. On our men's retreat, again, we, we deal with the areas of pornography and the onslaught of pornography. And for us men that are older, we didn't grow up with iPhones. So it was maybe more about a magazine or something that we saw, but culture influences us, influences us. Or maybe when you were in junior high, the locker room, or you're moving through puberty and um, things are shared and you don't have any understanding. So it's just whoever's the oldest or seems to be the smartest junior higher becomes the educator, right, in that regard. And so culture is definitely one of those uh, things. Now, I think culture can be positive and culture can be negative. So let me explain. Uh, in the area of pornography, we definitely see the negative. I think you understand that uh, enough. But positive in this sense. Um, my kids go to a public school in the state of Idaho. And, you know, and it's interesting that in the states, uh, United States now, did you know that 16 states recognize pornography as a public health issue? 16 states, this is our culture, is recognizing that pornography affects the brain and it's, it's a health issue, public health issue within our country. How many think that's a good step forward, that culture is saying? Really, I think it's a great step forward. But in my kids' uh, class, their fifth grade class, as they're getting ready to go to junior high, in our public school, they have a meeting with all the girls and their moms and all the boys and their dads. And they bring a speaker in and they talk about puberty. They talk about the importance of why God made, they don't say God, but the importance of deodorants, and deodorant is your friend, and that showers are good, you know, because in middle schoolers, that's the worst thing to do, cut your fingernails or shower, you know. And uh, they talk about hygiene. They talk about that you'll have hair follicles growing on your chest and around your genitals and under your arms, and they'll just talk about life, and then they'll say, and there's more to this subject, and the guy will talk for about a few minutes, and he'll talk about, uh, attraction to the opposite sex, and he has all this conversation, and he says, and there's m even more about this, and as you guys leave home tonight, your dad's going to talk to you about more, right? And so I remember taking that with my boys, and the conversation that they had about a half hour with some question and answers, I thought, isn't that great that at least the school is trying to help the kids realize that you're gonna, your, your body's going to be changing physically, and that you're going to be develop, going into developmental stage where um, your body will change. And that affects your sexuality. It affects a lot of aspects of your brain. It affects a lot of aspects of how you interact with people. And so providing a safe place. So in our town, I just said to my wife, man, this is so neat that the school's providing something like that. And, and, and just talking about puberty. Well, this year, I was the one that did that talk with the fifth graders at the school down the street from my house, right? And I said to the parents, hey, I'd love to talk to you and the kids because the dads and the kids are there together. And you know who the conversation is always hardest for? The dads. <laughs> the kids are kind of giggling and the dads, it's kind of an awkward conversation. So culture, I would say, can be positive or negative. There's another way we come to learn about our human sexuality, and that is our faith communities. This is a faith community here, right? How many of you attend faith Bible here? Just about all of you? Okay, all of you do. So, so this is a faith community. So think about your, this community or the community of faith in which you grew up, you grew up in, 
was sexuality taught about in a healthy way? And was it talked about in a very open way? And was it integrated in as a part of our life and human development? And did churches provide a place to where we were educating parents about how to have this conversation about values and sexuality with your kid? And I would say that it didn't happen in the world in which I grew up in. And so in some ways, um, religion didn't know how to integrate faith and sexuality, right? They were, they, 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 it was a difficult, and unfortunately, whether it's Catholic, Protestant, or Orthodox, unfortunately, some of the abuse that has happened sexually from the religious leaders even more shows about the unhealth of some of our religious organizations. Are you with me on that? The third area that I think we come to learn about sexuality is, well, let me just say this about faith communities. I really appreciate people like Tom and Michelle who are open and honest with their story and are lowering shame in faith communities to move people toward becoming healthier in this area of their life and, and, and creating church to be a safe place to even bring in or allow someone like me to come and have this kind of opportunity uh, to share. But the third area that we learn about our sexuality should be our family of origin. It should be our parents, right? It should be our homes. And uh, when it's done right, I think it can be wonderful and it can be educational. And, and I know for me growing up as a young man, uh, we didn't really talk about that in my home. In fact, my mom gave me a book when I was 12 that says 12 years old and what you need to know about sex. And you know what I did? I didn't read the book, I just looked at the pictures. That's all I did, right? But at least my mom tried to even make an effort to have that conversation about human sexuality. And again, we know that our homes can be healthy by parents creating a safe place to have that dialogue, or they can be unhealthy. Uh, our faith communities can be healthy by creating opportunities to learn about how to, and our culture can be healthy. Uh, but unfortunately, we live in a culture uh, where the number one sex educator today for our children is the iPhone. That pornography really is becoming the sex educator of our kids today. It's really tragic, and it's just the world in which we live, like it or not. And there's a wonderful organization, I want you to write this down, it's called Culture Reframe, like a frame on a picture, Culture Reframe. And uh, culturereframe.org or .com, it's a great website to look up because this is a non-faith-based organization that's really given you some good studies about how pornography is affecting our culture. and. It can educate us just from a, um, a neurological, but a social aspect, and they do a really good job. And so that's another great resource I want to kind of lead you to. But, but here's a piece of this is uh, the first point I want to talk about is personal health. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about my story, and I'm going to share uh, some language about sexuality that I, that I hope you don't see as inappropriate. They're just words typically we're not used to hearing in the house of God the house where God lives, right? So anyway, at least we're not in the basement. So at least we got an upgrade, right, Tom? We're not in the basement anymore. We're right here in the house of God. But uh, anyway, we're gonna talk about some of those things. And the first one is just pursue personal health as a parent. And I love that we have some teenagers here today. I love that because we're gonna blink our eyes and 10 years is gonna go by and you're gonna get married and you're gonna be the parent. So I love the fact that you guys are here today listening to this presentation because it's not gonna be long when you wanna take all that was good from your parents and then you wanna pass on that and, and what wasn't good, leave there and improve. But the first one is um, pursue personal health. It's the teaching of Jesus when he said, love your neighbor as what? As you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I think this is where many times in our faith communities we've kind of missed it in the sense of the gospel we started with that we are uh, we have no righteousness in us, that we're sinners, and unfortunately that message can slide over a little farther to where we're worthless sinners. There's nothing good about us, right? And in my opinion, the message gets a little bit distorted. To me, the gospel begins with Genesis 1. In the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth, and then God creates us male and female, in their image. And when God created Adam and Eve, God stood back and said, this is good, this is very good. 
And then the first thing God did was bless them and said, be fruitful and multiply. The first commandment God gave Adam and Eve is, go for it. Someone light a candle tonight before you guys go to bed, right? That's what they were saying. They gave, them, they gave blessing on their sexuality, and they saw that it was good. Their humanity was good, and their sexuality was good. So I say that to say what's true about Adam and Eve is true about every human being on this planet, that we're intrinsically good, not because of what we do right or what we do wrong. Not, I'm not talking behavior. We're good because we're made in the image of God. And how many you know God doesn't make junk, right? And God loves what he creates, and he creates what he loves. And so starting with the premise that what's most true about you, your humanity, and your sexuality is actually good. It's good. But many of us weren't start with that premise or didn't really understand that. Did you know that a baby girl, when she's born, she can vaginally lubricate in the first 24 hours of her birth? And a little boy, when he's born, he can have an erection in the first five minutes of his life. And now some of you women might think, well, that explains a lot right there. Thank you for the clarity there. The reality is it's not because those children are perverts. It's because that's their humanity. That's their sexuality and their sexual beings. And somehow, and you can wrestle with this all you want and think about this in your mind, but if we're sexual beings and we have the ability to bond to have great pleasure and to procreate, somehow we're made in their image. They created us so that we could participate in this activity and when done right, which we believe is with one man and one woman in a committed covenant relationship of marriage, it is to be a wonderful thing. So God gave us sexuality, in my opinion, for three reasons, for pleasure, for procreation, and for bonding. And this is the beauty of what we see in, uh, in, in our divine worth. But pursuing personal health, I think, is really important. And the reason why you do that is because you have great worth. But sometimes we don't always see our great worth. We don't think we're worth it. So a little bit of my story, um, how, how I came to a place of finally seeing my worth. Uh, I was born in Salinas, California. I'm going to share a little bit of my testimony. Uh, my father was a Assembly God pastor in a church in Modesto, California. We moved there when I was five. I was the youngest of five kids. Uh, my dad pastored a, a church where the building was about this size. I can remember as a little kid. I used to sleep on pews like this on Sunday nights, right? So being here on a Sunday night is bringing back memories for me because I, I logged a lot of services back in the 70s in church. We went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Monday night. And as a little boy, I used to say, church, church, church. That's all we ever do is go to church, right? Because I wanted to go play baseball or something else. And if I could explain my father to you, who is 91 and one of my best friends, my dad is a cross between Billy Graham, Ronald Reagan, and 10% John Wayne. That's my dad. You got a visual on that guy, right? That's my father. And he would stand up here. And I didn't think my father ever did anything wrong. That's how much I idolized my dad. In fact, when I was 16, I said to my mom this question, has dad ever sinned? Now, can you imagine some of the wives in here, your kid asking you if your father's ever sinned? And you know what my mom said? Oh, hon, I assure you, your father has sinned, right? I mean, she had, she had perfect clarity of his humanity. In fact, what does the Bible say about sin? For all have sinned, right? None of us have clean hands. But I knew when I was a young boy and I was exposed to pornography, in my teen years, I didn't feel safe to come to my dad and say, hey, dad, I saw this. How, how should I manage this now in my life? All I know is, wow, it did something to my brain, and it created all this adrenaline in me, and it created arousal in me, and how do I even manage that, right? Wouldn't it be great if a kid felt safe enough to come to their dad and ask him that question? How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but thinking, I could never talk to my mom or dad about those things, or some struggles maybe that I had in this arena of my life. So personal health. So for me, I loved God. I was deeply committed to God. I would come to church. I would pray. I would ask God to help me with this problem. But again, culture didn't seem safe to talk about these things. And so I would come to altars and pray and ask God to help me. And I never really got freedom from this part of my life. And so my, my, my story is, is long and it's a journey. So 
when I got married, I really thought this as a young Christian man, and I was confessing to my brother at the time, but I'm going to kind of speed through my story, but I thought when I get married, married is going to, marriage is going to fix this problem for me. And how many of you know when you get married, it fixes everything? If you have a problem, just get married. It'll fix everything. Wrong. Marriage doesn't change you. Marriage just reveals more of what it finds. For the, so for the young people here today who are single, let me just encourage you that your health is the best gift you bring to marriage. So especially in this area, the more you can understand and learn about what's healthy about human sexuality, how to manage it correctly, or how it can be mismanaged, that's actually going to help you as you step into marriage even learning language to communicate and articulate about healthy sexuality. So long story short, I was married with kids. I mean, a long story short. I really said to God, I'm not transforming in this area, and this is a continued problem. I'm not healthy. And it wasn't that I wasn't confessing, because I was confessing to my brother who was 20 months older. I was confessing to the Billy Graham, Ronald Reagan dad that I had at the time. And I thought for sure that confession alone would remove this problem from me. And what I didn't realize is that pornography is not just a moral issue, it's a brain issue. It affects your brain. And so if you have a physiological problem, at time you need a physiological answer to really learn how to retrain the brain. And do you know what the Bible calls retraining the brain? There's a word for it in Scripture. Repentance. Metanoia. Changing how you think. That's what the word means in the Greek language. So when Jesus says, repent and believe the good news, the kingdom of God is at hand, he's saying, change your thinking, there's a better way. And so for me, my road to healing in this area of my life started with going to visit a drummer who was playing the drums in our church in Portland, Oregon. He was a sexual trauma assessment treatment therapist in our community in Portland. Now how many know for a young Pentecostal boy, Going to a therapist like that was pretty scary. We didn't go to those therapists in those days. We just came down front and prayed, and then all your problems would be gone, and you would just go out and hope you wouldn't do it again. So I say that in my story to say, when I wasn't transforming, and and I'll even be as bold to say, when my religion wasn't transforming me. Because remember, the gospel that Jesus preached was about transformation. He used words like eternal life and like the kingdom of God. It was about a participation in their life here and now that transforms us from the inside out. And so I recognized I had some unhealth in my life, and I went to a therapist. And and that started a three-year process and a long journey of realizing that pornography had become a real issue in my life, and it had become an addictive issue in my life, and it affected how I parent my children and how I interact with my wife and it affected my integrity and my, and my being. And so that started this journey of getting healthy. So one of the things that we talk about in our resources is that the first best gift you can give your children is your personal health. And I've heard so many stories of men or women who struggle with addiction in these areas or negative history, sexual history that's happened in their life, maybe something that they participated in willingly, or maybe even something that was done to them when they were younger through abuse that they didn't want to happen, but it affected them deeply. But it became that secret that you couldn't tell anybody about. Now what we know in recovery is your sick is your secrets. And one of the things that healthy people do is healthy people get in environments where it's okay to be real and be honest and share. And so this is what I love about churches, not just a place where you all face the forward and listen, but where you turn your chairs to one another and you begin to share your stories. And the Christ in you begins to heal the brokenness in me and we can get good resources and material that help us understand the truth and really begin to, um, to grow and to change and transform. So this first thought today, I would just want to start by saying this. Healthy people, it's on your handout there. Healthy people seek help and seeking help is a sign of wisdom, not a sign of weakness. It really is. The healthier individuals that are in this room today, if you realize in my sexual history, there's some issues that I've never really processed and have been able to talk through, I think I'm going to go get help in that area. And I would simply say, go get help because you're worth it. You're worth it. So if, you were, if I was your pastor and you were my congregation, and I were to say this, if you're in our congregation and you're participating here today, and you've been hurt by someone's sexual brokenness, 
and you've never told anybody, and you went and sought help through a group or through a therapist or through a resource that you could process that, and you could find healing in that part of your life and learn how to not let that horrific tra uh, trauma shape you for the rest of your life, but you were to find freedom from that, how would we feel about that as a faith community? Would we celebrate that? Would we want the young man or young woman who had been abused to sit here and not let anybody know, or would we want them to find freedom and find healing in their soul? I hope you would say we would cheer them on if they went and got help and found freedom. Or the person who struggles with this issue of addiction could actually say, hey, this is a real issue for me. And for our children now in culture, it's an issue that pornography is an issue that they all will see at one point. It's just now as parents helping them know how to manage that. So here's a couple uh, terms I want to talk about here about being healthy. Um, when I was a kid growing up, there was a lot of rules. And so religion seemed more about what you didn't do than how you were transforming. So we, we had a lot of rules in my holiness kind of church growing up. You know, you couldn't play cards because cards led to movies, right? And, and, and movies led to dancing, and dancing led to sex, and sex led to the worst sin of all, bowling. You know what I mean? Just a whole downward spiral of evil. You know what I'm saying? And so it was kind of confusing to, to kind of recognize what's that. And it was sometimes more about behavior modification than inward transformation, about doing the right thing because you want to, because you believe it's the better way, not because you have to or somehow you won't be accepted or loved in your community. So when you think about um, getting healthy, I just would simply say um, wherever you're at in your own journey, as a, as a parent, I'm grateful that there are resources that are offered here in your congregation for men and women where you can take steps into being healthy as an individual. And I would simply say, that's the greatest gift you could provide your kids. There's so much I can say here, but um, you get help when you see your worth and value. When my daughter, I'm going to share this story. It's one of the stories that we turn into the book. There was always a lot of uh, pressure when I was a kid growing up. There was a concept called um, the promise ring or the purity ring. How do you remember that in churches? It was a real issue that they promoted. I, I, I think that the heart behind it was really good. How many want your kids or grandkids or future people in your world to make good, healthy decisions with their sexuality? Raise your hand. Right? I mean, yeah, we're all in for that. But their motivation was simply... We want you to come, we want you to make a public promise, and we want you to, to put, well, we're going to put this ring on your finger, and your promise is that you will never make any bad decisions sexually or have sexual intercourse before you're married. So the intent of wanting to help our kids manage their sexuality, that was brilliant, that was great, nothing wrong with that, but sometimes how they went about it was difficult. So for me as a kid, struggling growing up in my sexuality and realizing that for me, my struggle always made me feel like I was left then, that I was the unpure person, that I was the one that didn't get this all right. So what, so what about the rest of us? What about the ones that have made mistakes? So as my kids were growing up, and my, my oldest, uh, Whitney, she turned 16, I uh, took her out on a date. I went and got her nails done, which is called, uh, ladies, it's called a manicure. Thank you. I get manicure and pedicures mixed up, so, uh, you know. Um, we took her to a jewelry store because I wanted to buy her a special ring when she turned 16. So I said to the jeweler, I said, uh, this ring looks pretty. And she, Whitney put it on. I said, that's a great ring. And he said, Mr. Wright, that ring cost $10,000. And I said, Whitney, I love it. It doesn't match your eyes. But other than that, that's the perfect one. Let's keep looking, right? So we found another ring that kind of fit our price tag. And I, it was in the hundreds, not the thousands. And so I purchased this ring. And I took my daughter out. And I gave her this ring. And I said this to her. I said, Whitney, this ring is not a promise ring. This is not a ring that you have to promise your mother and I something like, I promise I won't make any bad decisions in managing my sexuality before I marry. Because it's not that I don't think you're, you're capable of making good decisions, but, but there's a lot of things I want you to make good decisions on. And I don't have a ring that says, promise me you'll never lie because I don't think lying's the better way, or promise me you'll never steal, or promise me you'll never cheat. I said, hun, I don't have enough rings and you don't have enough fingers for you to make the external promises of what you'll do right or not do right in life. 
But here's what I want this ring to be. This is not about your promise to us. This is your mom and I's promise to you. And here's what it is. It's the promise that says, regardless of the decisions you make in your life, in sexuality or any other area, your worth and value will never change in our eyes, regardless of your decision. You will always be our daughter, and we will always love you. And our love will never turn away from you. And I want you to know that. And I put that ring on her finger, and she was crying, and I was crying, because I've come to believe that we make far better decisions when we see our worth and value as human beings, and we have a love and respect for ourselves, that that becomes a healthier place to begin to make decisions of how we're going to manage parts of our life. And I did the same thing for my boys. Of course, I didn't give them a ring because that wasn't cool to wear rings, but I tried to make the same conversation, that it's starting with our worth and value. That's so, to me, very important. And I said, hon, if I can love you this much, the Bible says, how much more does God love us, right? And so understanding, if I wrote this because I really believe this. If we really can't show our kids their worth if we don't see our own worth first. So if you're a parent here and, and, and you haven't come to terms with some of your negative sexual history, this if I could scream it, knowing it would have more effect, I would, but you're worth it. You're so worth getting help and finding places to talk and process all that because your health in this area is going to be one of the best gifts that you give your kids. Well, the second thing I want to just talk about here quickly is holistic spirituality. It's an interesting term. It sounds kind of new age, and I want to, I want to steal it back from the new age movement and re reclaim it here because holistic spirituality is what Jesus says in Mark 12 when he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. It's about integrating the way of God in all areas of our life. So I put a couple little pie charts on your page. I hope, Hopefully you can see them. But just to illustrate a point growing up that I think is important with our children, and that is the first one just looks like life has a lot of different aspects to it. Our hobbies, our activities, our work, school, physical, emotional, financial, friends, family, sexuality, and if we're married, married. But whatever state of life, that pie can be filled with all kinds of things. And then we think, well, when I come to faith in Christ, the pie adds a couple more dimensions, right? So in my, this is kind of how I used to think that now I go to church or I have my devotions, and so I have my life, but my devotions and my church this is how I used to think this is my spiritual life. When I go to church and I pray and I read my Bible, that's spiritual activity, right? That's, that's my spiritual life. And so for me, this concept of spiritual versus non-spiritual or this concept of um, Christian versus non-Christian, right? How many remember that terminology we used to use? Like, are you listening to Christian music? Do you have Christian friends instead of non-Christian friends? Are you eating Christian tacos instead of non-Christian tacos? You understand what I'm saying? That category starts to break down after a while. And so a better way to say that is about healthy versus unhealthy and managing versus mismanaging areas of our life. So in my life, if you were to look at my life with my addiction, I was going to church more than ever. I was reading the Bible and praying but I didn't know how to integrate the way of God in my emotions, my traumas, or my sexuality. I didn't know how to do that. And that seemed like the bad part of Rodney or the evil part of Rodney or the part that Rodney didn't understand. And so when we talk about holistic spirituality, we talk about that last pie there, that yes, we may attend church, we may be in a group, we may um, do our devotions, but it's not just doing more of that makes us more spiritual. It's about integrating the way of God into all those areas of our life. Does that make sense? So this is where that whole concept of whatever you do in word or deed, do all is under the Lord. It's about the integration of God. And I think this is where religion, in my opinion, has had a hard time knowing how to integrate our faith with our human sexuality. So even language about that, talking just about our anatomy with children, so let's talk about some of the practical things about this. Uh, again, this, this isn't our full training, just a piece of that. But as kids are growing up as young children, your home should be the place where they come to learn about their anatomy. This is their elbow. This is their ears, right? Their noses. 
boys have penis and testicles and scrotums and girls have vaginas and we talk about nipples and those are just languages that we use, words that we use because the home is a safe place and you give them correct words for proper body parts and then they can begin to understand what that is, right? So you teach them language and you teach them appropriate times to touch themselves like when they're going to the bathroom and when they're going to the shower. That's always an appropriate time. And when is not the appropriate time for touch to happen, right, in those regards? And you teach them about nudity, and all of those things are all a part of those education. Well, when I was seven years old in California one summer day, our neighbor kid, Joey Kazenza, dared my brother and I to go streaking up and down the neighborhood. Now, it was the 70s, and we didn't, know, we didn't say, hey, it's the 70s. We didn't know that. But we just knew that we had heard about streaking even at a young age. Like, he's a streaker, woo, right? And so my brother took off his shorts and went streaking up and down the neighborhood at eight. And Dumb went first, and guess who followed? Dumber, yeah, I was right behind him. Woo-hoo! My mom gets a phone call. Uh, uh, Mrs. Wright, uh, pastor's wife, you know, the local church, your boys are streaking up and down the neighborhood. We just thought you ought to know this, right? My mom hangs up the phone. You know, she probably had a wig blow off then. I don't know, but she was like, oh, my gosh, frantic. She gets us inside, and she says, go to your room. Wait till your dad gets home. Well, Billy Graham, John Wayne, Ronald Reagan comes walking down the hall in our room, and he's pretty upset at us. Now, in my opinion, when your kids are young and they do things out of natural curiosity, remember that. Many things that they're doing, they're just young and they don't understand and they're just being naturally curious. It doesn't necessarily mean they're evil, they're just curious. And so in my opinion, what Rodney and Ryan needed at that age was to be trained and guided, was to be educated. Hey, just because a 10-year-old boy tells you to do something, it doesn't mean you have to do it, right? And if something happens where you feel threatened, you can always let your mom and I know. And we don't take off our shorts and run up and down the street. But we do take off our shorts in the shower, when we're in the bathroom. There's appropriate places for nudity, and there's places that they're not appropriate for nudity, right? Instruction, education. Now, do you have this, young guys? Can you repeat back what I said? You know, just making sure that the message got cleared. But that was the, not the experience I had. The experience I had was a, a real scolding, uh, getting blistered with my pants off. And as my dad left my room, as a young boy, here's what I thought. He's not safe. Whatever you do, don't ever let him catch you doing anything wrong. Now, that wasn't my dad's heart or intent. My dad's heart was to help us. And so this is a, a point that we really talk about, about learning to give training and guidance, not just shaming and punishing. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Do you understand the difference of that? And I'm not saying that there isn't a place for correction or there isn't consequences for decisions. What I'm saying Make it about educating and helping them learn something, not just punishing them, but it's about getting correct information so that they get it. And so these age-appropriate conversations, these, 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 these integration of what's healthy, I think is a really important aspect of our life. So, you know, if you were to find Jesus in Palestine as a young man when he was 20 years old and say, hey, Jesus, how's your spiritual life? He would have looked at you funny because they saw everything that they did was they did it under the Lord. So how many know there's something called swapping addictions? Have you heard of that concept before? So let's say someone is an alcoholic. They stopped doing alcohol. Now they just do food, and they, they really have a struggle, and they use food to cope with that negative issue, or they use shopping, or they even could use religion to cope with that because they don't want to face some kind of a painful experience in their life. And most of our addictive behaviors are coping mechanisms because we don't really know how to integrate the way of God or faith in some of those difficult, painful areas of our life. But I'm so thankful now that there are resources and tools that can really help us say, hey, I can click to be a healthier person. And how many know that it's good to pray, it's good to read your Bible, it's good to attend church, but it's also good to get eight hours of sleep a night? How many know that's a really good thing? And how you know it's a really good thing to get a little bit of exercise every once in a while? It's a really good thing when you're wounded and you have a loss in your life. It's a really good thing to grieve that loss. And our grief isn't what's wrong with us. It's what's right with us. 
And Jesus even grieved at the funeral of his friend Lazarus, right? He wept. So it's about integrating what's healthy, the way of God in all areas of our life, and not compartmentalizing our spirituality. And I think if we can do that, you know, this will really help us uh, when it comes to helping our kids in the area of sexuality. Here's an interesting passage I want to read to you in 1 Corinthians 6. Um, does that make sense of that holistic spirituality? You, you understand that concept there? And, and pursuing health. I think that's a, a, it's a really important one. And so we want to, we want to try to uh, raise that level of education in the area of sexuality and talk about how to integrate our faith and manage this area in a, in a good way as well. 1 Corinthians 6, there is more to sex. This is out of the message version. There's more to sex than mere skin on skin. Sex is as much a spiritual mystery as a physical fact. As is written, the two become one. Since we want to become one spiritually with the master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy, leaving us more lonely than ever. I think he says it pretty well here in this passage, how he, how he says it. The kind of sex that can never become one. There is a sense in which sexual sins are different than all others. In sexual sin, we violate the sacredness of our bodies. These bodies were made for God-given, God-molded love for becoming one with another? Or didn't you realize that your body is a sacred place, a place of the Holy Spirit? Don't you see that you can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for? The physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to the spiritual part of you. God owns the whole works. It's a, this is about integration here. This is about a culture who said the physical doesn't matter, just... What, what, what we do in the spirit is all what matters. And Paul's saying, no, physical, it all matters. It, it's the integration of all. So let people see God in and through your body. And then he goes on in chapter 7. Now getting down to the question you ask in your letter to me first, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly, but only within certain contexts. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. The sex drive is strong, but marriage is a strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sex life in a world of sexual disorder. And the marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy his wife and the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. I love this passage here. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. Now, how's that for practical modern reading of Scripture, right? It's about the integration other-centered living of the way of God in all areas of our life. And so I think this is really important. So in our book, our, our final thought here is we, we talk about creating healthy environments. This is really what we think that your home should be is a safe, healthy environment. And one of the first ways that I spent a little more time on tonight was that the way you're going to do that is you get healthy yourself. And, and your health, what we model, is more important than what we say. And if your health, just not only in just your activity, but you've, you've um, embraced your story or any kind of negative challenges in your life, and you've learned how to now integrate that and share that. So for me, part of my journey was I found sobriety years ago, decades ago. It was, I was in my mid-20s when I sought help through that therapist. But I had a lot of shame about my story. I didn't want anyone to know this part of my story. It was kind of that secret, shameful part of my story. And my kids were getting older, and they didn't know about my journey to counseling, or they did, but they didn't know all the details. We haven't had a, a time to um, share with them. Uh, my wife and I together disclosed kind of our journey. And so I took my boys camping at a state park there up in Idaho, and it was a wonderful time. They were just, they were just young kids, you know, maybe, maybe 8 and 11 or something like that. And we, we, it was just the boys camping, and it's just one of those settings where conversations should just be great. You know, there's no... No phones, there's no uh, TV, there's no video games. We're just, we're just out there in the woods. And so we built a fire, I'm cooking chili. And it's just one of those settings where it's just like, hey, we're going to really, this is a great time to connect with your kids. And then one of my kids asked me this question. He said, Dad, have you ever looked at porn out of the blue? He knew what to call it, and he asked me if I've ever looked at it. And I was not ready for that question, Right? And so you know what I said, this great spiritual leader who's written books of how to help your kids? You know, what, you know what I've said to my kids? Who wants more chili? 
I so changed the subject as fast as I could, and I got onto that chili, and I started stirring the pot. Hey, are we going to go fishing tomorrow? I just totally went a complete different direction. And you know why I did that? It's because of S-H-A-M-E. It's because of shame. It's because I had too much shame, and even though I had sobriety and I was managing that part of my life physically right, I hadn't integrated in my emotions and my shame hasn't healed. And so I recognized that day. Now, I, when I tell that story with my boys, because they're 22 and 26, they don't even remember that story. But guess who does remember that? Guess who that pause was like an hour and a half pause before I said, who wants more chili? That was my pause, right? So here's what I would say to my kids now if they were to ask me that and they were in that age. I would say, yes, your father has looked at pornography. And what we realize is that pornography really affects the brain like a drug. And it really becomes a problem. And just as we wear a helmet on the outside when we ride motorcycles to protect our brain, pornography hurts our brain on the inside. And it does damage to your brain physically. And so we need to protect our brain on the inside as well. And pornography really is, is, is uh, a misguided message or a distortion of something so wonderful in, in your human sexuality that God wants you to share in marriage. Because sexuality is a wonderful gift and it's to be shared in marriage. And unfortunately, people use other people as objects just for physical gratification. Now again, that would have been a lot for a seven-year-old to get their brain around. I wouldn't have said all that, but I, what I'm trying to tell you is I would have had a lot different more things to say. And I would have gave them information and I would have said, yes, I have, and it was hurtful to me and your mother and other people. And if you ever see that, I want you to know you can always talk to dad about that because I want to help you because I wish I could have talked to my dad about that when I was your age. That probably would have been the more appropriate conversation. But what I'm saying is I would have had a lot more to share because I would have been prepared because I would have done my health work in that regard. So in our book, we talk about these these 10 chapters, and the first one is uh, pursue health and educate yourself. There's a lot out there that we talk about, a ways to find good education about learning. I mean, you obviously want to learn. You came tonight just to be a part of this presentation, and I say kudos for you, but there's a lot we can learn about educating ourselves. Um, we also talk in the book about foster connection, and I'm going to give us just in a minute here, I'm going I'm to open up for questions, but this is a point I want you to take away. Our greatest human need, in my, in my estimation, isn't our need for sexuality. Although sex is a wonderful gift and we have those natural drives in us, our greatest human need is intimacy. It's to intimacy, and here's a great definition of intimacy, into me you see, right? Intimacy. And this is what, the God, that, this is what in my opinion, God is like, Father, Son, and Spirit. They're intimate to one, to one another. And so into me you see just means that you're sharing not just what you think, but how you feel and your emotions, and you're being real and you're being vulnerable to one another. And so if I could say anything to parents, if you, if you just take away one thing, foster connection with your children. Foster emotional connection where they can share their feelings, whether they're, whether they're positive emotions or negative emotions, emotions that cause them to feel comfortable or discomfort. Allow them that you're a safe place where they can process what's going on inside of them so that you can create that intimate connection. And that's a huge part of helping our families in this regard of um, understanding how to manage uh, their sexuality. We talk about welcoming questions, about being ready anytime, about training and guiding, not shaming, about focusing on growth, not perfection, about keep modeling and, and never turn away. I love this quote by Brene Brown. She says, when you deny your stories, they define us. But when you own your stories, you can write a brave new ending. I love that. And those of us that are owning our stories and that are saying, hey, we want to help our kids and, and, and move the ball down the field in this arena. We want to learn how to integrate our, our, our sexuality and our faith. We want to learn how to have these age-appropriate conversations. Um, this is really, really important and really key. So um, anyway, in a nutshell, it's the environment you create in your home for your child to know you're the safe person to come and ask their questions to. And it's okay at times if they ask a question and you don't know the answer. You can say, I don't know. Or, well, what do you think the answer is, right? And how many have already had a question from your kid that you, don't, you just went, oh my goodness, did he just ask that, right? Right? 
I'm putting my child to bed one night. He's five years old, my little boy. And he says to me, Daddy, how come my penis gets hard? Now, that's a question that I couldn't ask my dad when I was 18, let alone five. He knew what to call it, and he felt safe to ask his dad. How many think dad should be the place where that question should be asked? Absolutely. And I said to him, well, that's how God made you. That was my first response to him. Who gives men that ability? Who, who's, who, in whose mind did that ability drive from? God? God did. That's how God made him. So I said, God gave you that. God made you that way. And that happens to your dad and every other man. And when you wake up in the morning, it means you have to go pee. That's what I told him. And he said, okay, Dad. And he had his little Buzz Lightyear outfit on, right? Because he was watching the Buzz Lightyear movies. And he said, are we going to wrestle tomorrow or something like that? You know? And I laughed and said, oh, yeah, buddy. And I went downstairs and I said to my wife, uh-oh, hey, I just had this crazy conversation with our kid. And I hope I didn't mess it up, right? And I didn't mess it up because I met him with age-appropriate information and helped him see that his body is good that he can talk about that with mom and dad, and mom and dad become the safe place where they can ask those questions. So questions grow as they get older. That same kid in the van one day said, Dad, my wife's asleep, I'm driving the red van. He said, Dad, is it true that babies come out of mom's vagina? Now, how many know when the word vagina is bouncing off the minivan that everybody wakes up as an adult in the car, right? And so I'm driving this, Tracy's awake now, and I just, it, I'm just thinking, here's what I'm thinking. Oh, it's on in the right van right now. It is so on. And I said, yep, buddy, that's exactly how God made it. When moms have babies, it comes out of what's called the birth canal, and it's really an amazing miracle uh, that moms give birth to babies that way. His sister, a year and a half older in the back seat, says, see, I told you. Because mom had talked to her, and she was now passing on the family wisdom, right? Culture that you establish where it's okay to ask questions and get age-appropriate answers, right? And I'm looking, and so I said, you know, buddy, when moms have babies, it's really, really special. And it's, but, but I have to tell you, it's a lot of pain for moms. When they have babies, it's a lot of pain. And honestly, I'm just glad God made me a boy because I'm not sure I could handle that. And his eyes got big as the saucers, and he said, me too, Dad. And he looked at his sister and said, sorry about that, Whitney. You know, like, someday you're going to have to have all this pain Dad just said, you know. And we all kind of laughed, and we chuckled, and we drove in. And again, Tracy and I thought, well, now, wasn't that an interesting conversation? It's not the one conversation that you have for 100 minutes. It's the 100 one-minute integrals where you talk about those things. And, and in our book, we write about, uh, I just, I'll say this with no shame because I don't have any shame anymore. We try to share as many of our mistakes as we can because you young parents, we want to help you not have to make ours. That we want to show you there's actually a better way. But I wasn't raised where you were vulnerable. Where being vulnerable wasn't seen as the strength. We just, I'm here to tell you everything we did right by our book because we did it all correct. How many know no one does it all correct, Right? In fact, we've said this to our kids. We're Christians, we're ministers, and we say this to our three adult children. Whatever you see is healthy in your mom and I's relationship and our marriage and how we raise you, whatever's healthy and good, please take that with you in your next family where you start to have kids in marriage. But whatever's dysfunctional about your mom and I, are you with me here today? Whatever's not healthy, about how we communicate, resolve conflict, talked about sexuality in, in ways that weren't maybe really helpful, had shame, um, whatever, whatever's unhealthy, please leave our dysfunction here. Please don't pass on my dysfunction to us. If you can, put it all back on me. In other words, learn from my mistakes and move it forward, right? And I think, I, I think that's just, I think that's real humility, to be honest with you. There's, you know, there's a difference between humility and pride and false humility. Pride says this. Pride says, hi, my name's Rodney. Here's all my strengths, and I have no weaknesses. That's pride. Here's false humility. Hi, my name's Rodney. Here's all my weaknesses, and I have no strengths. Here's humility. 
Hi, I'm Rodney. Here's my strengths and here's my weaknesses. Humility is just self-awareness. It's just a wary. How do you know you're not good at everything? Right? That's why you need a plumber, a mechanic, someone to help, you know, a seven-year-old to help you turn your computer on and get your TV set up, right? You're not good at everything. You can't have all the gifts. So healthy people recognize, healthy people seek help. Healthy people recognize that, hey, I'm going to just give my family the best I can, and I want them to learn from my mistakes. And this is where I find the teachings of Jesus very attractive. Jesus wasn't shaming people for their mistakes. Jesus was trying to lead them to healing and wholeness and trying to offer them a better way to live life. And so there's only about 45 more stories I can share with you in this regard. But in our book, we also have a whole chapter on the area of masturbation because we think that's a very difficult uh, subject for many Christians to talk about. And so, and many times there's just been silence. I mean, I, I've done men conferences with 500 guys, and I said, how many of you guys are so grateful for the talk your dad had with you on masturbation? Because it was so educational in helping you guide that area of your life. And, and two guys raised their hand out of 500, right? And the majority is we don't have language or know how to even talk about our, our bodies, our nerve endings, self-stimulation, masturbation. Then you add on pornography, you add on the culture of sexual brokenness, how do we begin to navigate all that? And in the book, we talk about what the medical profession says, we talk about different views within the church. Now, we work with a sexual addiction ministry, so we recognize that masturbation can be very harmful and sinful and destructive in people's lives. But within Christendom, there's a lot of different views from people like Dr. James Dobson, who started Focus on the Family, to, um, to good Christian uh, psychologists and psychiatrists that speak about that. So in the book, we just give a lot of different opinions within Christendom about thoughts and reasons why people think and believe the way they believe on this. And here's what we say to you as parents. Read through this. Talk about how your parents helped you or didn't help you. Talk about how you managed that as a young man or a young woman growing up. But whatever you do, don't be silent on the issue. Get your kids resources. Uh, have an opinion on it one way or the other. And, and don't tell them because that's exactly how God thinks. Just say, here's the reason why, because this is how I see the scriptures or this is how I see the truth lived out. But give them the reason why, why it's not the better way to live. Right? Because don't just tell them, don't do this. Tell them why you wouldn't want to do that. Or tell them, if you do that and you have guilt, be a safe place where you can help them manage that part of their life and areas. I'll just say this in ending because this is, I think, real crucial. I think many kids don't navigate that season of their life in just an exploratory and it doesn't become addictive and destructive way. It's because our kids live in a world where they're so, number one, onslaughted with pornography. That's number one. But number two, they're just not developing holistically where they learn how to feel good about a lot of different parts of their life. So because of a lot of those negative influences, they could hyper-focus on their sexuality. And I think this is when that hyper-focus is when just masturbation alone can become a habitual thing that, that, it, that they do just to feel good about themselves because it's the only area of life that they get a sense of meaning or pleasure in whatsoever or any, any dopamine hit to the brain. But have any, anybody ever, ever been fishing and you got a nice bass on the end of that fly rod? You know what that does to your brain? That's dopamine, right? It's pretty exciting when you got a fish on. So there's a lot of ways in life that, we, that the brain produces dopamine in a good, healthy way. And so it's helping your kids recognize not, not to do that. And uh, our culture says in order to be intimate, you have to sexualize. And we lived in a sexualized culture. But the, whole, the book talks about that piece of, that, of the chapter, which I think is a hard subject for a lot of parents to know how to articulate or communicate. Again, I don't think it's where our faith is always integrating that. And, and it's okay to have different convictions on that. We definitely know pure desire, how it can become destructive and painful in people's lives. Um, but anyway, that's it. And then our, our final piece is just that don't ever stop loving your kids and keep growing as an individual. So... My dad's 91, he's still alive, 
I tell them life's short except for you and mom. You guys are going to live forever. But for everybody else, life's pretty short. And my greatest joy of my father is I still watch him keep growing as a Christ follower, still learning, still being humble, still admitting his mistakes in life. What a great example he's showing me as a 52-year-old father to keep growing and keep the relationship. You know, where I may disagree with your values, but I'll never, ever turn from you. Um, can I share one more story? All right. In the conservative church in Idaho where we pastor, I was under the addiction pastoral care area and marriage and family. And I had parents would come to me and say, Rodney, you've got to help me because I have a gay son or a gay daughter. And I can't let anybody know because I felt like I've done such an awful job. What did I do wrong? And they had a lot of self-condemnation and they were beating themselves up. And so uh, what I did is I, I really felt compelled because you know we had a, some individuals that this was their issue. And I thought, man, these guys need a safe place to process all that and talk about that. So I started a group in our congregation for parents or family members with somebody in the LGBT community. And before I did that, I thought, I better run this by my kids. My wife was okay with it, but I didn't want any of my kids to think, I wonder which one of Pastor Rodney's kids is gay. You know what I'm saying? You know how, you know how religious people can judge? I mean, you probably don't have that problem in Maryland, do you? You probably don't have it here. But sometimes religious people can make judgments about somebody. So I said to my youngest son, hey, I'm going to go do this. What do you think? And, uh, you know, he's like, Dad, who gives a hell what people think? Go help them. You know, he was just like, go help them. Help, help, help. And... Um, so we started that group, and we went through a book by Andrew Marwin called Loves and Orientation, which is just a really great written book about bringing people to Jesus, not a religion. And one of the things that we really wrestled with is how do we follow the way of Jesus and keep loving our kids even though they choose different values than us? How do we love even though someone has different values than us? How do we love even though someone's choosing a way that we don't think is the better way that Christ offers. How do we love people who have different values than us? And what does that look like practically? Right? How do we do that? What is that like? And I'm so grateful that the example we have in Scripture of how to love sinners and be a friend of sinners is Jesus. Right? And so we, we, we just let Jesus be our model to say, well, how do you love people who have different values than you? And what would that look like? But you know what it did? It lowered shame, and it again gave people a safe place to process these different parts of their life and how to move forward on that. So anyway, I hope that helps. I, I could probably talk for another two hours, but you can't endure it, trust me. So, uh, and I, and I, I think I should stop right there. Tom, I told you to raise your hand when I was done. So, you, okay, awesome. So any kind of questions or thoughts or comments about any that I, anything that I've shared here today or um, yeah, John? In the sense of how to help their kids or about your own story or about what? That you haven't had conversations with before? Yeah, that, yeah. Well, um, part of what we, we talk about in the, in the book is that our puberty and our sexual feelings are different than our sexual behavior. So learning, so, so sometimes our sexual feelings are involuntary. They just happen at times, right? They just do. And we have to learn how to manage our sexual feelings or what we would call certain things cause arousal in us. And sometimes they happen at the most awkward time when you're in junior high, you know, or different places, you know, in our adult life. And so that whole self-awareness is what we're trying to teach our kids, is be aware that some of that, if we're not careful, can, can, can move toward lust. And so we have to learn how to manage our sexual feelings. But we can't always control them, but we can manage those feelings because we learn how to manage our behavior. So we talk about behaviors that, how do I treat myself and others with worth and value in this arena, right? And what do you believe is the better way for sexuality as an adult? And why is marriage 
better than a, a relationship outside of marriage? And so what are the reasons behind that? And so I think educating your kids. So, you know, if you, if you get if you have sex outside of marriage, you know, you got to think about pregnancy, not in a fear way, just in an education way. You got to think about STDs. Uh, you got to think about a bond you're having. You got to think about this could be somebody else's spouse for the rest of their life. You're just trying to help them see that the way of God is the better way. It's not a restrictive way. God's not trying to take away your fun. God's actually trying to help you show the better way. But we definitely have a delayed adolescence in our culture um, where kids are getting married at a much older age now. So they have to manage that part of their life as adults much longer. You know, So th does that help in some regards? But, you know, um, so in the book, those are all... But I would rather have the discussion of, well, Dad, here's what I think, or here's what... I, I welcome the discussion with the kids. Let's, Because I believe the way of God... I, I just don't think you could say your kids, because God said, so just do it. Well, tell me why God said that. Why is the way of Jesus the better way? Why? And that's where I think we have to engage our brain and really speak about the way of God is the better way. And um, the, the whys behind that is really crucial with our kids. That's a, that's a really good question. Yeah. 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 That's a great question. Did you hear that at camp from somebody? I think I asked that question to you earlier. There's touche, touche on that one, Eric. I love it. It's great. Eric's like, we're going to find out tonight when Rodney talks about that. Well, again, I, I grew up thinking, Eric, that all my sexual emotion and feeling was lust. All, everything I had was lust. So just my normal adolescent development was all evil and bad. And so I think the difference is, is when we're aware of our uh, arousal, not connecting our, our arousal, not hyper-focusing on maybe the first stimulus that came our way. So sometimes it's just about, this is where, if, there's two concepts we talk in the book healthy versus unhealthy. So we talk about what's healthy in human sexuality and what's unhealthy. And then we talk about manage and mismanage because I manage my money, my time, my resources, my health. You know, we're managing a lot. So helping that kid with some of those concepts to say, boy, you may come across something that makes you aware of your sexual feeling, creates arousal. Now what you do with that is really important, right? So sometimes the best thing to do is flee this situation. You guys are all going into that place. I'm not going into that place. Sorry, buds. I'm, I'm, I'm turning and going a different direction, right? Or I'm not sure how to process this feeling that I feel. And so um, uh, we, 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 we give some specific examples when it comes to that arousal piece of some language that some psychologists have, have offered, you know, in that regard in the book um, about connecting your sexual thoughts and feelings to the concept of marriage thanking God for your sexual feelings, and God, someday you're going to give me a partner to share this with, and I just want to try to manage this in an honorable way. And I realize that pornography or connecting it with another person, those are not the, the way of God. Those are, the, those are not the better way. Those are the way of the, the sinful way, and it can uh, be destructive. So, again, language, and this is where the, we would encourage the parent to say, what are your convictions what are your thoughts on some of these other adult areas when we talk about masturbation or we talk about just how you're going to manage that as, as a human being? And if, you know, when you feel guilt, who do you talk to that about? And mom and dad can be a safe person where if you want to talk about that, you come talk about that. Dad, how did you manage this? You know, um, one kid asked his, asked his dad when he was growing up, he said, Dad, I've had a lot of nocturnal emissions. He didn't use that word. He's, he, he was, he's sitting in the back seat with his mom and dad. He says, Dad, I've had a lot of wet dreams now recently. He's like 13 years old, 14. And he said, Dad, did you have a lot of wet dreams when you were my age? And he said, my dad looked like he saw a ghost. All the blood went out of my dad's face. And he just kind of froze and said, no, I didn't have them. And just, you know, like, like, and the kid was like, I knew right then and there, oh boy, it got awkward in the car. Whatever you do, we don't talk to mom and dad about that. And this is a part that I think is really important. I would rather my kids come to me with a problem than feel like they can't come to me and years later they have a pattern established. This is real crucial. 
So us being a safe place, us being grace-filled and educated-based and trying to help them see, not shaming or punishing, um, you know, it's the whole statement of Jesus, where are those who condemn you? Neither do I. It's not the condemning voice, but it's the instructive. Now, because you see you're not worthy of death and condemnation, you have great value. Now I want you to go and sin no more. You know, so there, there was something about helping us see that if we make a mistake, it can be a learning opportunity, not a shaming opportunity. And I think for those of us that struggled like I have as a parent, it's my worst fear that my kids would ever struggle in any of this area. I want to try to save them from all that. Um, and we talk a lot about mistakes being a part of our learning. And not all mistakes are sin. Some are. Many of them are. But not all mistakes are sin. It's like the little kid who said to his dad, Dad, did Jesus ever make any mistakes growing up? Isn't that a great question? And the parent thought and said, well, I don't know, son. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, thought, which is a great way when you're asked a question by a kid. If you ask him, what do you think, it at least buys you 30 seconds you know, to think about what your answer might be. And here's what the kid said. Well, Dad, if Jesus didn't make any mistakes, how would he have learned anything? Now, how do you think that's a pretty brilliant answer from a child? So let me just give you a concept about mistakes. When Jesus was learning to walk as a two-year-old, did he ever fall down? When he was learning to write his name in Greek or Aramaic, do you think he ever misspelled it or didn't do it correctly? When he ever built a table in his father's carpenter shop, did Joseph ever say, now Jesus, we want you to measure twice and cut once. Nice try though, son, right? Or did he just grow up saying, mom, don't worry about potty training, I got this squared away. I'm the son of God. Did Jesus have to grow in stature and wisdom, right? I'm not, I'm not at all suggesting Jesus sinned. No, he was sinless. But sometimes mistakes are a part of our humanity. They're a part of just learning and growing in things. You know what I'm saying? So again, just, just creating an atmosphere where you're focusing on growth more than perfection and on maturing. And part of growth is just being open and honest and owning your mistakes and you know, uh, creating an environment where you can learn from that. Okay. Good question. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a response. It may not be the right answer, but it's a response, right? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, so sometimes, you know, we, we, we do need to flee situations, but we just need to be aware that not everything may be less that could be just a normal part of your, that you have to manage. Because we want our kids to manage this not just before they're married. How many know you have to manage your sexuality after you're married? It's not just something you do prior to stay pure before marriage, and then when you get married, you cannot be pure. That's a bad message. No, this is a good gift. We, you're going to learn to manage it your whole life. I do as a married man, and so you're going to need to do that as a young woman or a young man in, in your life as well. Any other questions? You want me to share that story? I had it in my notes, but sometimes I feel like I, I'm sharing too many stories. So my son-in-law came to me, and I, I mean, how would you like to be the son-in-law of the sexual addiction pastor, you know? Uh, you know, the guy that you know is going to ask questions, and, you know, we get honest here. And uh, my son-in-law, Daniel, has been very honest about his journey, which has been really great. And so we have a real uh, great information. In fact, I recommend that just every young person go through a Living Free or one of the Pure Desire courses just because... They're all exposed. As, as a staff pastor, I would have all of my young staff that joined us just go through a seven pillar group. I just assume they're kids and they see stuff and we want church to be the healthy place. And how many know if you're not healthy on stage, that's not a good thing, right? And how many know you can wear masks on stage and be a minister and not be healthy? So we want our, our, we want our, our staff to be healthy, male and female. So anyway, I said to Daniel when he came and he asked for my daughter's hand in marriage, I just came back from elk camp. I had all my camel on. It couldn't have been better, you know. We were eating at Michael D's, Scott, and uh, he, I knew what he was going to do. I knew, I knew this young buck was going to ask for, you know, uh, my uh, daughter's hand in marriage. And so he took out his iPhone, which is so millennial, right? And he said, hey, I got this. Do you think your daughter is going to like it? And it was a picture of the ring that he was going to give my daughter. And I said, I, I, I looked at it, and he, I paused, and he said, Rod, I would like to ask for a Whitney's hand in marriage. And, you know, this is a special moment. I mean, for me, you know, I just thought of my little girl and her value ring, and, you know, dads, come on, you know. 
And I love my kids, my boys the same way too, you know. Then I've always heard stories of what the father-in-law would say to the son-in-law coming in, you know. You know, don't hurt her, I know people, you know. If you ever hurt her. And I said to my son-in-law, because I'd really given this some thought, I said to him, Daniel, here's what I want you to know, is that we would be honored if you would take Whitney's hand in marriage and uh, you want to marry her. But I want you to know this one thing, that you need to promise me or you need to understand one thing, that there's one person I need you to value more than anybody else in this world, and it's you. I need you to see how valuable you are, and I need you to love yourself well. Because if you love yourself well, and I'm not talking about being narcissistic. I'm talking about self-help and be healthy. A love that takes care of yourself. A love that makes good decisions because you believe it's the best for you. I said, I want you to love yourself well. And if you love yourself well, then I know you'll have no problem loving my daughter, Whitney, as your wife. And you'll have no problem loving my seven grandchildren that you guys are going to have. And I did throw that one in on him, you know. And I said to him, Daniel... If you ever doubt your worth and value and you feel tempted to do something that doesn't show your worth and value, I want you to know you can always come talk to me, your father-in-law. I got your back. And I want you to know I can be the safest person because I want you to always see your worth and value. And I want you to make your decisions based out of that. You know, So that's what I told him. And hopefully what that does is it sets a different... How do you know that's a different tone? That's a different culture? That's about people being for you. Um, and, and, and to me, that's just that's really how I see the message of Jesus. Jesus didn't come to point the accusing finger and say, you bad, bad, bad people. Jesus came to extend the hand and say, hey, you guys in the ditch, I've come to show you a better way to live. We've come to show you the way out of the deceitfulness of sin into sharing our life and our existence. So this is why I believe that God created humanity. And I share this normally on my Sunday presentations. God created us so that they could share their very existence with us, their life. We were created in their image to be relationally connected. And what mismanagement of sexuality can do is it can become an intimacy disorder where it keeps us from true intimate relationships. And when you have intimacy in marriage, I say to all the kids, intimacy in marriage is, and good healthy communication about sexuality is really a wonderful gift. And you're sexual beings, and you will be from birth to death. And we just need to learn how to manage that and integrate our faith in that. And thank you, Faith Bible, for at least opening the doors to have this conversation. Because I think you're going to be some of the healthiest people because you're just trying to keep learning and growing and and uh, moving forward on that. So that's that's the story. I, I any other question? Yeah. 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 Well, I, you know, a couple things. The, the way we wrote our book, there's a lot of resources out there. I gave you that framework of culture reframe, but we wrote our book to be used as, uh, or it can be used, there's discussion questions at the end of the book, each chapter. So out of the 10 chapters, you could do it in a small group and then you could, you know, because there's a lot of wisdom in this room, right? So the wisdom isn't just me. I mean, we got Dick in the back that's, how old are you, Dick? Uh, 51? 77. How I many know he's got a lot of wisdom sitting back there at 77, right? So the tribal wisdom, I would love to be in a group with Dick and his wife and say, and read a book like this and say, and have Dick share about, well, let me tell you about my journey and how I learned and what my culture was like. And I mean, because... That's where I think one of the things is, is that these can be good group material. I think just what you're doing to educate about pornography, that's why I think everyone should watch the Conquer series. At least all the men and women, are, are just the more you can see it and realize how it's affecting the brain of our kids. And they're good kids. When a five-year-old stumbles onto something on their phone, they're not an evil kid. They're a good kid. They just are getting inundated. And we want to know how that home can be a place to talk about it. Or just do trainings like this. I mean, my wife and I could come back and do a training for more of your congregation. That's kind of what we do. And she's way smarter and better than I am. So, you'll, you'll, you know. But I just think these are the kind of ways where we need to look to educate. And I'm grateful for all the ministries that are trying to, trying to help get us get healthier in this arena. 
But to me, if you help a child when they're younger, that's going to be way better than just helping Rodney in his mid-20s. You know what I'm saying? Or 50s or 60s. So the more we as young, that's why I love seeing the young parents here. Um, so that's how faith communities can do it. And they can not demonize sexuality, but see that our sexual feelings are not all lust and evil. Some of that's a normal part of our development. God made you that way. And there's a lot of confusion within culture about sexuality. And I think, uh, again, it's because we live in a sexualized culture and a, lack, a culture that's lacking intimacy. So the church providing good places where it's safe to be intimate and real and uh, educate can be really, really good. Starts with me as an individual, starts with my marriage, and then that can create the home, that uh, environment that I can create. So, okay. Yeah. Yes. We give general guidelines in there, and some of those have come from Cliff and Joyce Penner, P-E-N-N-E-R. They have some stuff that's very clinical, but I think is really good. So I've tried to adapt that into my own language. But here's a couple good rules. Um, my kids, when I uh, I took my kids on a little, uh, Dr. Dobbins did preparing for adolescence. I don't, I, does anybody remember that or hear? You know who Richard D James Dobson is? Focus on the family. You guys know who that is. So I took my boys on this weekend trip, just trying to do something, you know. And my dads would say, my, my kids would say, whatever you do, don't ask dad about puberty. He just goes on and on and on and on, right? So probably some of the things we parents can, some of the mistakes I made is don't try to give too much information at once. Again, think about short sound bites um, and think about just ways of, you know, if questions arise, you're kind of ready to have that discussion, you know? So again, when they're younger, anatomy, uh, here's how we talk about the body parts, it's okay to do it. As you're getting older, how do you manage those as far as, you know, safe, tricky people, and if you're touched by somebody inappropriately, you can always talk to mom and dad um, about when is nudity okay and not okay, and then when sexual feelings come and we start to understand arousal and, and, and we start to mature in puberty, and then now how we manage our behavior. So you have these feelings, but, but our behavior is another aspect that we manage and how we, how we manage that part of our life. And actually, the, actually the pinners take it all the way to when we're elderly and how we manage it when you know, the, the parts don't work like they used to, as they would say, right? And then how you have those conversations now. And, and that's an, a whole other aspect, but I think it's that, that you know, this is... And then, because what you're trying to get your, your child to do is in marriage, they can communicate about their sexuality to their spouse. They can communicate their need, their partner can communicate their need, and they can learn how to meet each other's need and have good communication about sexuality. And sometimes, this is a, one thing that's kind of tragedy, good couples who make more, good moral sexual decisions in church, they get married, but they've never even learned how to communicate about that part of their life. So it's not like that part is even meaningful or beautiful for them because they, they lack the ability to communicate or articulate, you know what I'm saying, about that area because they're so uncomfortable with it. And so the goal would be that we would grow into being loving, mature, being able to communicate about our sexuality because we don't see it as evil. And we realize that we have different uh, physiological needs, male and female, you know. And so, um, you know, like my wife said, you know, you know, there is something when we first got married, she said, you know, there's something called non-sexual touch, you know. That's what my wife said to me. And I said, well, I married you for sexual touch. I don't know if you knew that or not, but I, you know, we kind of laughed and chuckled about it. But the ability to talk about our needs for affection rather than sexuality, the need to talk about, you know, all of those aspects, that's part of that conversation that's happening. But typically, you know, uh, short is better and frequent, you know. And, and sometimes they, uh, Tracy shares a story in the book our young kid comes home and, and says, uh, during the Bill Clinton scandal with Monica Lewinsky, do you have context for this now? Is everybody on the same page with me? Our little boy comes home and says this, mom, comes home from grade school, mom, did you hear what the president did? And Tracy's like, oh dear God, no, oh dear God, no. Oh, oh, you know, and she's just thinking all of her worst nightmares. How do we explain you know, this concept of, uh, you know, not, not, you know, oral sex or mismanaging your sexuality. He's like, oh my gosh, you know, 
She goes, uh, what did you hear? He cut down his mom's cherry tree. Because he was learning about George Washington, right, in school. And Tracy said, oh, yes, I heard about that. <laughs> she was like, oh, God, thank you, you know. I didn't have to have this conversation, right? Mom, did you hear what the president did, you know? So sometimes it's always good to say, well, tell me, or you know, ask, because you may answer a question that they're not actually asking. <laughs> and so it's always good to reflect that question. What did you hear? Why are you asking that? Oh, I learned about George Washington as a little boy in school. And I did So sometimes just reflecting about, you know, we talk a lot, we, there's a whole piece on that where we talk about reflection and, you know, giving yourself to, to, to have those uh, kind of dialogues with your kids. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so cool you're here. Yeah. Um, mm, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I don't think there's a rule on that because sometimes you know that um, one person can be a better communicator uh, just, uh, you know, to be able to articulate. Now, my wife, she would say that was Rodney, not her. <laughs> In fact, one of the things that my wife talks about is she just assumed my daughter, she didn't, she, you know, she's she would sh want me to share this, but she just... She wishes she would have had more conversations with our daughter because she feels like that's kind of where she dropped the ball because she kept waiting for our daughter to have a boyfriend and our daughter didn't have a boyfriend growing up through school. And it wasn't like bad, it just never really happened. So sometimes I think it's just about what parent is connected with that kid and that um, if you can have that at your dinner table, that can become a good place. But if not, sometimes uh, while you're doing something so that it's not just, hey, we want to have our talk, it's Thursday at 7, remember our appointment? I mean, everybody hates that, the kid and you. But just those natural settings, and I, I think it's just about who feels co connected and comfortable and is the setting right to have the conversation. And it's amazing when it happens. And, and my wife beats herself up, but I think she had, she had some conversations. You know, I remember my daughter opening up the sliding door saying, Mom, I just started my period, and it just rang through the neighborhood. And I'm out there raking the lawn thinking, do we share that like that? Is that how that works? We, is we supposed to have a party and invite people? I mean, man, she, she, she just shared it. Like, no shame. Like, you know what I'm thinking? Oh, boy, here we go, you know? Right? Yeah, exactly. So just the more, and if you feel like it's, yeah, you know, uh, I don't educate everybody else's kids, but I try to direct them to healthy people, so you want to be careful. But I'm just saying, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but just, again, the more you understand, that's why we say educate yourself as a parent, and there's good resources out there where you can learn some things and learn language. And if you don't know something, I think it's okay to say, you know, I'm not real familiar with all that, but we'll, we'll talk to your mom. She's pretty smart. Like my little boy said, my mom's a genius one time. He said that telling somebody about his mom, like, my mom's a genius, you know, like, so I think as parents, just whichever one has the connection with the kid. Um, I, I, I share a struggle with one of my sons in the book where there was a season where he didn't tell me he loved me for about a, uh, two years. We really had a tough, tough season. He was navigating some challenges, and it was really difficult for me as a dad. I mean, extremely difficult. Harder than navigating my own addiction was saying, how do I connect with this kid where I feel like we, you know, and... Um, that was difficult, and I really sought some outside counseling. Just to, I didn't want to make it worse. I didn't want to be the religious dad that was hard nosed or trying to. And uh, you know, I just I had to kind of less is more, and we navigated that season. And uh, you know, now he's the kid that says, uh, "Dad, I can't wait for my kids to meet you someday. You're a really great guy." You know, and it, trust me, that wasn't what he was saying at 16. You know, so. It, sometimes you just have different seasons where you feel close or not close to the kid, and I think just as long as you and your wife are trying to do your best, or when you have a conversation, tell that to your wife at the end of the day. Hey, I just had this cool conversation, and here's how it went. And you can even say, I blew it on that one. You're going to have to rebound that shot. It missed. Good luck, honey. You know, And that's okay, too, because sometimes we don't always get it right, and isn't that refreshing to know? 
right? You won't always do this perfectly because none of us are really... And let me just say this to parents who feel really bad. Adam and Eve had three parents. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They were perfect parents who never made a mistake. If you think there's any family... Now, they had three of them. We just have two in our marriage. If there's any parents that could grow kids God's way, don't you think it would be the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit whose kids would not make any moral mistakes? Are you hearing me? So if it's all about perfect parenting, don't you think the Creator would have gotten this thing right? Right? I don't say that to make excuses. I just say that to say sometimes we need to have grace for ourselves as parents and realize that we're going to try to, we're going to, try to help navigate our kids the best we can with the resources we have, and mistakes may be part of this process, but we're going to love them like God does, and we're going to try to help them through that. So a culture of grace that does have consequences, we're not talking about not having that, but we're just talking about a culture where you want them to keep growing and maturing, um, not about a mistake-free culture in that regard. Okay, good questions. Yeah. Yeah, let's open that up to the floor here first. What do you think would be a good response? I mean, you know, at least he felt safe. You know, at least you had some kind of a dialogue with him. You know, it could be a tough one, can't we? Especially if you don't. So first of all, you know, um, here's just off the top of my head. You know, you, the reason why it feels good, son, is because how God made you is God made nerve endings on the head of the penis. They're called nerve endings, and when you touch them, sometimes they feel good, right? Now, that, now we're just explaining how the human body works, right? Now, you don't have to say to your son, and when you get married, it's going to be wonderful. Thank you, God, for creating us this way. You, know, you, don't, have to, you don't have to carry that out, but you just want to say, and, and, we, and sometimes we do things that feels good, but we want to be careful that we don't always do that in public or that you, know, you want to give him some structure of how to, do you have to go to the bathroom, you know? Uh, Again, asking questions, trying to develop a conversation with that. You know, it, we don't want to touch ourselves like that in public. That's really not appropriate to do that. Um, but again, some of that's just trying to distract and guide him on to other things. Uh, try to normalize as much as you can without kind of um, uh, over um, affirming. Yeah, that's okay. Keep doing that all you want. You understand what I'm saying? So I think it, it's it's kind of tricky in some regards about affirming that's how their body is and there are certain times that you ever smell something, son, that just smells so good. Remember when your mom makes your favorite spaghetti or pizza and you smell it and you can just tell when you walk in, oh my goodness, that smells so good. Well, there's things in our life that are good, but sometimes you know if you overeat or you, do, you mismanage something, again, I'm giving you way more maybe information than you would say to the little guy, but short languages of helping him see that his body isn't bad just so he doesn't kind of get that message you understand what i'm saying your body and how god made your body isn't bad we just now have to begin that management conversation about that you know um and so i think that's uh, off the top of my head that's you know a, a, a one way i would try to try to move through that anybody else have any thoughts on that I'm not touching that with a ten foot pole. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right, 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 right. I, I think, and the reason I say this is normalize. Try to normalize their 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 physical body is good, and not a lot of us got that, you know. And uh, you weren't trying to say his body's bad and this is bad. You're just trying to, you know, you were just trying to do the best you could with making sure that this doesn't maybe turn into something it shouldn't for him at a young age, right? I mean, that, that would be, so your intent, your heart, man, that's, you're just, we're just all trying the best we can in this regard. Um, again, the Penner, P-E-N-N-E-R, they have uh, some good, they're a good resource. We talk about them a lot in the book as well, but just trying to affirm, educate, and then help them manage that in a, in a helpful way in that regard, you know.
That's off the top of my head. Uh, my wife would probably have some, you know, some language on that as well. Okay. Anything else? Hey, thank you for letting me come and share. You have been really gracious to me and kind just being here and engaging. So thank you very much. I hope it was helpful today at some level, yeah. Uh, here's the book. You could go to the Pure Desire website. So if you're interested in a copy of it, you could uh, order it. Uh, you can pre-order those and, and uh, so you can use them for group discussions or whatever. Yeah. Super. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, buddy. Let's pray real quick to close. Uh, appreciate Rodney. Dear Lord God, we just thank you so much for Rodney and the wealth of knowledge he brings us, whether it's in our sexuality or just life. Uh, it's been a true inspiration to me in my walk, and uh, I just thank you again for his knowledge that uh, what he brought to us tonight is helpful to the people here. They take it home and do whatever they can to... Uh, open up their eyes to the sexuality of, of our families and our kids, and that uh, we continue to follow you each and every day, reaching out when we need that funding hand. Thank you for all that has come tonight. Thank you for Rodney again, and his travel comes tomorrow. Bless us all. Amen.